he was devil. He was genius devil, but devil. 20 million Soviet citizens died at the hand of Joseph Stalin. He was absolute ruler for 25 years, a Bolshevik czar. He craved power. He never could have enough power. The system of terror was essential to Stalinism. Terror was, was continuous, continuous, continuous. I was asleep, and all of a sudden, I woke up and I saw strangers in military uniform in our apartment. No uh, signed uh, a number of uh, orders to execute people uh, who were totally innocent. At the end of the 19th century, Russia was the largest country on Earth. From the fertile fields of the Ukraine to the frozen tundra of Siberia, this ancient land was big enough to hold the United States and Europe within its borders. The ruler of this vast empire was Tsar Nicholas II, the shy, awkward inheritor of the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. He and his family lived a privileged and genteel life. Typical of the European royalty, they actually were. Nine out of 10 Russians, however, lived in villages, eking out a living from the land. In 1879, two of these peasants gave birth to a son, Joseph Jugashvili, later to be known as Joseph Stalin. Joseph's mother was a maid and washerwoman and a devout Orthodox Christian. His father, of whom no photos remain, worked occasionally as a shoemaker and was a violent alcoholic. The family lived in this shack in the tiny village of Guri in the Russian province of Georgia. His father was incredibly poor, very poor man. And he had terrible passion to drink. He beat wife, he beat her cruelly, violently. And so this violence come in his heart from his childhood. He was an awkward looking boy. Young Joseph's face was pockmarked by small pox and a childhood accident left one arm shorter than the other. And he stopped growing at five feet, four inches. He was quite small. He, he liked to have wedge shoes, make them sort of a bit higher. And he had a very dark, sinister look, particularly his eyes. They're always described as yellow or tigerish eyes. Uh, th that was his main impression given. He was a good student, good enough to enroll in a seminary school. But the priesthood was the last thing on Joseph Jugasvili's mind. Fifty years earlier, Karl Marx had written of a world where the workers, not the aristocracy, controlled the destiny of a nation. In Russia, these ideas were turned into a political movement, Bolshevism, by Vladimir Lenin, a man the Tsar's police thought dangerous enough to exile to Siberia. This excitement drew the shoemaker's son like a magnet, and at 19, he left school to join the cause. He was not much of a theorist, but he was militant and committed even masterminding a bank robbery to fill the party coffers in 1907. He was a man of action, which Lenin admired. When Lenin first met Stalin, he wrote to someone, I've met a magnificent Georgian. And it's clear that he saw in Stalin at that time the kind of person he hoped to attract to a movement that was then primarily a movement of intellectuals. That is a person with working class peasant origins, not an intellectual, but a person who, as Russians say, was very de la voy, could get things done. He certainly saw himself as a fighter, and in 1912, he began using the name Stalin, which means man of steel. But it was difficult to make any progress because Stalin and his comrades kept getting arrested by the Tsar's police. They languished in exile for years in houses like this one in distant Siberia. He was in prison many times. He was in exile 
endless time. And prison and exile would be for him as native home. And he will make prison and exile like native home for millions of his citizens in future. The exiles would soon get their chance. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand was shot by a Serbian nationalist in Sarajevo. World War I broke out a month later, and Tsar Nicholas sent millions of Russian troops to fight in his name. The men marched off proudly, but their enthusiasm soon sank as fierce German fighting decimated the Tsarist forces. Four million Russians were killed, wounded, or missing within a year. The surviving soldiers resented dying for someone else's cause, and morale plummeted. They refused to go to battle. They defied their officers. They deserted the army and went home to the village and burned down the landlord's manor house. And when later someone said to Lenin, who voted for the revolution, he said, the soldier, the peasant soldier voted, voted with his feet, he deserted. In February 1917, a crowd of angry citizens and disaffected soldiers took over St. Petersburg. The Tsar knew his government couldn't stand, and he abdicated a few days later, ending the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. A provisional government then briefly shared power with the revolutionaries, but in April, Lenin came back to Russia demanding a completely proletarian victory. The people need peace, he said, and they give you war, hunger, no food, and the land remains with the landholders. In October, his Bolsheviks swept away the moderate government. It was a momentous victory, but except for writing a few editorials, Joseph Stalin was not a part of the action. Later, he would have Soviet historians invent a heroic role for him. He would make his mark in the next and bloodiest phase of the revolution, the Civil War. From 1918 to 1920, counter-revolutionaries known as the Whites fought to regain power from the Bolshevik Reds. The fighting spared no one, and those that lived through it would never forget it. I was frightened. All the time I was frightened, because all the time different troops came. The Kiev was occupied, first there was a revolution. Then the, there was a nationalist government. Then came the Reds and occupied Kiev. Then came the Whites and reoccupied Kiev. The fighting was going on. There were two feelings, fear and feeling of hunger. Lenin's Bolsheviks now became military commanders. Leon Trotsky, the brilliant orator and theorist, was made war commissar. Stalin was given the title Commissar of Nationalities and was sent into the field to enforce the party line. It was a role that suited him well. War, and particularly civil war, brings the warfare personalities to the fore. And Stalin, already during the civil war, begins to become the leader in Moscow of these warfare personalities, these can-do tough guys who don't really want to debate the dialectics of Marxism, who don't really want to talk about the nuances of class struggle, but men for whom class struggle meant the fist. In 1918, Trotsky sent him a detachment of army specialists. Stalin, who distrusted the trained military, imprisoned some of the men on a boat which then sank under mysterious circumstances. He had many of the others just shot. When someone said this might be a problem at headquarters, the Man of Steel reportedly replied, death solves all problems. No man, no problem. For Lenin, Stalin was a real revolutionary. Uh, Lenin knew that Trotsky wanted to be a real revolutionary. Trotsky wanted to be cruel. Trotsky, Trotsky wanted to be a real executor for revolutionary enemies. 
but Stalin was cruel. Stalin was able to hate really. In the end, this ruthlessness would turn Lenin away from his protege. But for now, this small band of men would start pulling Russia into their vision of the world. And this world would soon be dominated by a single one of them, Joseph Stalin. Like most young men, Joseph Stalin fell in love and married during his early years. His first wife, Yekaterina Svanidze, died a few years after they were married. Their one child, Yakov, was left with her family. Stalin wouldn't see the boy again until he was a grown man. At the age of 39, Joseph Stalin married again, this time to Nadezhda Alaluyeva, the 17-year-old daughter of two friends from his exile days. They had two children, Svetlana and Vasily. But Stalin's attention was focused on matters of state. The Bolsheviks got rid of the last of the white forces in 1920. Now they would remake Russia as the first communist state. Marx had called religion the opiate of the masses, so the Bolsheviks set out to eliminate it. Churches were desecrated and priests openly mocked. I believe the most terrible thing in Bolsheviks empire that they were atheistic empire. They finished Russian religion. And the uh, result was terrible. They stopped to be people. They became crowd, incredible crowd. Food was scarce since the Bolsheviks had seized every scrap of grain during the war. Where were the food and peace Lenin had promised? This discontent erupted in the naval base of Kronstadt in the Gulf of Finland, when a group of sailors who had fought alongside the Reds in the Civil War began demanding food and political freedom. Trotsky sent in the Red Army and slaughtered the resistors. It was now clear the popular revolution was over. A few thousand Bolsheviks had absolute control of a nation of millions. In 1922, Comrade Stalin was given an important job in this new ruling class, running the party secretariat. On the one hand, it was just to keep the books. Where were the party members? Who were they? But it also was responsible for appointing people to administrative positions in the party. And like any good ward politician, he appointed people who seemed to be loyal to him, who thought as he thought, and he removed people he didn't like. His following was growing, but to get more power, he knew he'd have to outmaneuver the party leadership. After Lenin, the most powerful man in the party was Trotsky, who had emerged from the war a popular hero. So in 1923, Stalin formed an anti-Trotsky alliance with fellow Politburo members Kamenev and Zinoviev. Like all his alliances, this one wouldn't last. It isn't that they really liked him, but they were still taken in by him. It was an extraordinary way in which somehow they all find themselves working with him in 10 years later in the Politburo, and they still haven't understood he's going to kill them. But Lenin understood the leader of the revolution had suffered a stroke in 1922. Realizing the end was near, he wrote a secret will of sorts evaluating his men. He finally died in 1924, and this testament was read out loud. It said Trotsky was the most outstanding man in the Central Committee, but he was too inclined to be an administrator. And Stalin, well, Stalin was also a, a difficult man. And then he would put a PS saying, Stalin, it, it is really too bad. He's too rude and crude, and he must be removed from his post. But Kamenev and Zinoviev stood by their alliance, and Stalin stayed general secretary. It would be their biggest mistake. In 1926, Stalin allied with the conservatives, including old friend Nikolai Bukharin, to kick Kamenev and Zinoviev out of the Politburo. Soon, his conservative allies were ousted as well. 
1927, he demoted Trotsky from the party and then sent him into exile. Trotsky would never see Russia again. Bukharin said, Stalin knows only vengeance, the stab in the back. The grievous and ultimately fatal mistake of all of Lenin's successors, except Stalin, was they fought among themselves, sometimes allying themselves with Stalin when it suited them, sometimes not. And while these men fought among themselves over matters of principle, one of the great intriguers and political operators of the 20th century, step by step, destroyed all of them. By the end of the 1920s, Stalin was the unquestioned leader of the Communist Party. He'd now pull the Russians into his vision of the world, whether they liked it or not. The first step was to collectivize the farming, a cornerstone of Marxism. He had the better off farmers, known as kulaks, kicked off their land and sent to Siberia. More than 15 million of them were uprooted in the 1930s. The rest of the peasants were then forced onto enormous collective farms, but they didn't go happily. Furious farmers slaughtered half their cattle in 1930 alone to keep the state from having them. And despite these cheerful propaganda films, grain yields began to fall. The revolution wasn't working. Stalin had said that the new collectivization would produce far greater food, far more wheat than anything else. When it didn't, he said, we're going to get the food, the wheat, the grain, whether it's there or not. So he, they took all the grain, I mean, every scrap they could get, and even searched houses for cupfuls hidden in the floor. And, of course, the result was a terrific famine. Ten years' hard labor was the price for stealing an ear of corn. Eventually, some people turned to cannibalism. Those who lived through the famine would never forget it. More and more hungry peasants in the street. They went from apartment to apartment, knocked the door and asked for bread, and they didn't get it. Five million starved to death in the Ukraine. But Stalin completely denied the famine. He made even mentioning it a punishable offense. He focused instead on the more public achievements like the great industrial projects of the first five-year plan started in 1928. Stalin knew that if socialism was going to work, the Soviet Union would have to industrialize quickly. People threw themselves into the work and some industry rose out of the wilderness, but no amount of enthusiasm could fulfill Stalin's unrealistic expectations. Hardly anyone met their quotas, but since failure meant prison, or worse, accountants merely lied about productivity. It was impossible to find what the production figures were because every director had to fake his figures. Because if you, if you say you failed, you're out, so you might as well be caught a year later for faking, and this happened on a very large scale. This mass deception could only work if people were too terrified to tell the truth. So Stalin developed the Gulag, a group of labor camps where millions of people were literally worked to death. One man was sentenced to 10 years in the Gulag when his army tank got stuck in the mud. It was enough to convict him of sabotage. The prisons were full full of people who were 10 minutes late for work. Little 17-year-old girl, I remember, she came to our camp. She was 10 minutes late to work. Somebody stole some potatoes, sack of potatoes. They were getting three, five years in prison in labor camps. That was terrible thing. Terror was, was continuous, continuous, continuous. The camps became microcosms of the illogical world outside. 
I, I remember I was in one of the camps, and uh, the commander of this camp, he was, uh, he was continuing what Stalin did because he took on himself the mission to shoot at random every evening somebody. He selected three, five, seven people, 10 people, and uh, he was shooting them for nothing. Slave labor built some of Stalin's most ambitious projects, like the Baltic White Sea Canal. The canal was an engineering disaster and was soon abandoned. But a proud Joseph Stalin visited the site, proclaiming it a victory for socialism. These kinds of successes were impressive, especially to Western visitors like Charles Lindbergh and Anthony Eden. H.G. Wells visited in 1934, and when he met Stalin, he said, I have never met a man more candid, fair, and honest. Everybody trusts him. Behind the conversation. Franklin Roosevelt Which even reopened diplomatic relations, yesterday. closed since 1917. A better judge of character was Lady Astor, who asked Stalin how long he was going to go on killing people. He candidly replied, as long as necessary. He would find it necessary for the rest of his life. In 1929, Joseph Stalin turned 50 years old. He was now portrayed as a secular god, as the savior of his people. The propaganda was relentless. It was Stalin who brought you the revolution, Stalin who gave you food, Stalin who saved the Soviet Union from the corruptions of the West. It's very difficult to explain to the American people how much indoctrination and propaganda is all the time slammed on you. You are indoctrinated in something that when you are three, four, five, six, seven years old, you start to believe it, that it's true. School children were taught that Stalin was infallible. His ideas on philosophy, literature, and even genetics became state policy. The worship of Joseph Stalin was the new Soviet religion. People saw his portraits everywhere. Every newspaper, every day had his portraits. Uh, he, he was really everywhere. And when people go to sleep, last name which they heard, it was Stalin. If Stalin were to remain a god, he'd have to make sure no one threatened his rule. In 1934, Sergei Kirov was murdered, a man Stalin had hand-picked to head the Leningrad Communist Party. Kirov had been very popular, a little too popular for Stalin. Some say he ordered the killing himself. He also began purging the educated classes. Thousands of writers, artists, and scientists in fact, most of the intelligentsia were tried and convicted as traitors. The sentence was death or the gulag. And he almost eliminated his old enemy, the military elite. 57 out of 85 corps commanders disappeared, along with tens of thousands of lower ranking officers. The officers signed confessions, but these documents were highly suspect. The documents were produced a year or two ago. They all read, oh yes, I confess, it was a perfectly ordinary document. But they found that there were forensically verifiable bloodstains on the confession. And of course, torture was used on an enormous scale in the Stalin period. No one was spared. Stalin even tried the heroes of the revolution, men that a generation of Russians had grown up revering. From 1936 to 38, the old Bolsheviks were convicted of ridiculous charges of espionage and counterterrorism. He even purged his old ally, Nikolai Bukharin. Stalin needed a bizarre form of coronation as the great leader. By making 
Lenin's closest friends and comrades confessed to having been not real communists, not real patriots, not real Bolsheviks, but spies, assassins, wreckers. To force them to confess to these crimes was for Stalin the ultimate, or he hoped it would be, psychological fulfillment of this need to be the one and only embodiment of everything glorious in modern Russian and Soviet history. He needed these trials. Stalin approved the death sentences of these men, even though he knew the confessions had been forced by torture. Trotsky, who was in exile in Mexico, was the only one who could speak out. His trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from Stalinism. That is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. What is now my principal task? To reveal the truth, to show and to demon demonstrate that the true criminals hide under the cloak of the accusers. What will be the Stalin soon silenced him action. too. In 1940, a Soviet agent attacked Trotsky with an ice pick. He died the next day. It wasn't just the famous who were liquidated. Anyone could turn you in on a trumped up charge, a neighbor, a boss, even your children. Terror became an everyday emotion as millions just disappeared from sight. Every evening, nobody knew what's going to happen to him because the individual means nothing. The individual, uh, it's like a piece of sand in the big, big desert. You can run it over with a truck, you can, you can step on it, it just, you can crush it, it just means nothing. Yet Comrade Stalin seemed to remain above the fray. He blamed the terror on an overzealous police force and would periodically purge the head of the secret police and they weren't just killed, they were erased from all official memory. I'll tell you, even my grandfather, who was the victim of Stalinist repressions, uh, he was able to survive, and she did not complain about the Soviet power or even about Stalin. He thought that the local leaders, the local bosses were to blame. It's a very strange situation, the, the role that Stalin played in the lives of people in the Soviet Union. At the same time that he was evil and terrifying, um, he was secretive enough about it that I'm not sure that people until much later associated what was actually happening with the person of Joseph Stalin. But one person did. His wife, Nadezhda had learned about the famine from students returning from the Ukraine. She and Stalin began arguing frequently. One night at a banquet at the Kremlin, Stalin started flicking cigarettes at her across the table. She stormed out of the room and was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head the next day. What we don't know is whether she retreated to their apartment in the Kremlin and shot herself to death or whether there was a fight and he killed her. We don't know. People who hate Stalin greatly in Russia believe he killed her. People who still find some reason to say positive things about Stalin believe she committed suicide. And after that, as they say, his heart turned to stone. Nadezhda's death severed his last link to reality. He had seen enemies everywhere for so long that he could no longer recognize a real one. In Germany, Adolf Hitler was creating a society as inhuman and repressive as Stalin's Soviet Union. And while the Nazis and the communists professed to hate each other, in reality, a grudging admiration existed between their leaders. Stalin personally admired Hitler, the way how he manipulated with the people, how he got convert millions of Germans. Uh, so he was uh, sometimes even uh, watching him and trying to uh, use his experience. Uh, when, for example, in 
34, Hitler eliminated the commander of the SA troops, Ernst Ström. And uh, when Stalin uh, got to know about that, he told to his colleagues, he said, look at Hitler, what a bright guy, you know. He shows us how to deal with political opponents. In 1938, Hitler took Austria. By March of 1939, all of Czechoslovakia was occupied by the Nazis. Stalin knew he had to ally with someone. He had earlier approached the West, but Germany seemed like a better bet. They could offer him territory, the Baltics and half of Poland, and peace, at least temporarily. So in August 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact. Hitler would soon betray his new ally and bring the Soviet Union to the brink of disaster. In the summer of 1940, the German takeover of Europe seemed unstoppable. As the Nazis marched up the Champs-Élysées, Hitler started thinking that Russia might fall just as easily as France. It soon seemed clear that Germany would attack, but Stalin couldn't believe the Fuhrer would go back on his word. But on June 22, 1941, Nazi troops crossed into the Soviet Union. The foreign minister, Molotov, confirmed the news to Stalin. And when Molotov came to Stalin's office and told it, and Stalin just lost his speech. He could not even speak. He just sat down and was silent for some time because here he understood how Hitler practically tricked him, how he uh, misjudged you know, Hitler. The misjudgment was monumental. In a month, German troops were 100 miles from Leningrad. Smolensk fell on July 16th. At a meeting of the Politburo, Stalin moaned, all that Lenin created, we have lost. Most of the military command was gone, since Stalin had killed them during the purges. So at first, he made decisions himself with often disastrous results. Kiev was overrun in September, and his advisors begged him to evacuate the doomed city, but he refused, and over half a million were either killed or taken prisoner, the largest single loss of the war. Ever searching for a scapegoat, Stalin blamed the prisoners themselves. Well, he declared that all POWs were, to, uh, in fact, traitors who weren't allowed to be, be taken prisoner. And when they got back, they were sent to labor camp, most of them. When his son by his first marriage, Yakov, was taken prisoner, the Nazis approached Stalin about trading him for some of their own. Stalin said he had no son by that name. Yakov was shot and killed when he ran toward the barbed wire fence at the camp. To alter the country, he gave his son as a sacrifice. He could not have acted otherwise. If he returned his son, the ordinary people at the front and at home, what would they have said of him? Look at him, he saves his own son. And what about our sons, the fathers and mothers? Even theoretically, Stalin could not have done it, because he was Stalin. For him, the state was the most important thing in his life. By October, the Germans were perilously close to Moscow. Preparations began to move the government to Koyabyshev, 500 miles away. But Stalin decided to stay, even attending a parade in Red Square on November 7th. These tanks drove right past the commander-in-chief to the front line, just 25 miles outside the city. The Soviet troops fought valiantly, and the Russian winter began to cripple the German forces, freezing fuel lines and cutting off supplies. In the end, the Nazis couldn't solidify their gains. Stalin also wisely teamed up with the Allies. Starting in 1941, Franklin Roosevelt began sending airplanes, tanks, and guns to the beleaguered Soviet troops. If Hitler was going to be stopped, the war in Russia had to be won. 
In June 1942, the Nazis began an offensive in southern Russia. The fighting settled in Stalingrad, where it quickly degenerated into fierce house-to-house -house combat. This time, Stalin let his commanders do their jobs. The early part of the war, when he intervened, was almost always a mistake and caused several disasters. But by the time of Stalingrad, he was not intervening directly. He was a bit, but, but not on the scale he had been before. He did leave it to the generals. And um, so that was a success. Nazi troops began retreating from Stalingrad on Christmas Day, 1942. The war would drag on for another two and a half years, but Soviet victory was now in sight. When Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin met in Tehran in 1943, Joseph Stalin was reintroduced to the West as kindly Uncle Joe. Churchill even presented Stalin with a sword of honor to commemorate the victory at Stalingrad. By 1945, the Soviet Union had won the war, but the cost was enormous. Over 25 million Soviets had died, six times as many casualties as Germany. Stalin vowed to never let Russia be this vulnerable again. So Soviet forces liberated their neighbors from the Nazis, but the shadow of Moscow never left. Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and Eastern Germany were soon all within the Soviet sphere. At the Yalta Conference in 1945, the Allies met to discuss the post-war world. Stalin made it clear this territory was under his control. For Russia, fascist Germany was just another Western power come to Russia from the West. In those days, armies had to come through Eastern Europe, through Poland. And therefore, after this war with its losses, the Stalin regime was not going to settle for anything less than a guaranteed security zone in Eastern Europe. And that was the essence of the Alta. The Allies met one last time at Potsdam, and while they may have posed politely for the newsreel cameras, new U.S. President Truman and Churchill were unhappy with Stalin's behavior in Eastern Europe. The alliance against the Nazis was over. The Cold War was on. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Back home, Stalin was even more popular than before. Grateful Russians hoped that the magnificent victory would sweep clean the miseries of the past. But the war had only distracted, not changed, Joseph Stalin. Thousands of returning soldiers were sent to labor camps because Stalin was afraid they would revolt against life at home now that they had seen the splendors of Europe. Even his loyal translator was not above suspicion. My pass was taken away and I went out waiting that I would be arrested next day. But two weeks passed and nothing happened to him. I even didn't go home at night. I knew that they usually arrest people at night. And then all of a sudden came a call from a magazine, a weekly magazine, and I was invited to work for that. And from the editor of this magazine, I understood that it was Molotov who protected me. I don't know why, you know. Four assistants before me of Molotov were shot. Why I was not shot, I don't know why. Somehow he just, you know, put me there and probably also got some kind of blessing by Stalin that not to touch me. Few got off so easily. The crowds may have adored him, but Stalin was still sure everyone was out to get him. His newest public enemy was the Jews. Many leading Jewish intellectuals were tried as enemies of the state and killed. He even arrested the most prominent doctors in Moscow, many of whom were Jewish, because he thought they were plotting to poison him and his advisors. Quite a lot of doctors were arrested. But they were almost all Jews, but they named a group of eight or ten, of whom three were Gentiles and seven Jews. So he said, we're not being anti-Semitic, we're arresting Gentiles as well. But one of them was his own doctor. He wanted to arrest him because he told him to lay off politics for a bit. And he, he thought this was a plot, naturally. 
On Stalin's 70th birthday in 1949, pictures of the great leader were projected into the sky over Moscow. His all-knowing, all-seeing eye was everywhere. But his omniscience couldn't keep time from catching up to him. After a long feast on February 28, 1953, Joseph Stalin had a paralyzing stroke. Over the next few days, he slowly suffocated to death. He died on the morning of March 5th. The funeral was an orgy of grief. Soviets couldn't imagine life without their God and Father. I was in Moscow, only about uh, four blocks from the place where Stalin's body was laying after his death. A lot of people were crying, and they were crying because when you live in paternalistic society, you are raised to believe that he makes all the decisions for you, and without him, the nation will fall apart. Stalin's eventual successor, Nikita Khrushchev, would bring a wave of honesty to Soviet politics. But Stalin's memory would not go quietly. In 1956, Nikita Khrushchev gave an extraordinary speech at a closed session of the 20th Party Congress. He said that while Stalin had been a great leader, he had committed terrible crimes against the Soviet people. His listeners were stunned and some were angry. For a lot of people, it was the beginning of the end of belief in the system because if the man who ruled Russia for almost uh, 30 years could be so wrong and so maniacal and so horrible and so bloodthirsty. What did that say about all of them who had lived under his rule and had been a part of building this system? Leonid Brezhnev and his successors went back to the silence of the past. But in 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became general secretary, he vowed to break the stranglehold that Stalinism had left behind. His reforms pulled the Soviet Union away from the secrecy and terror of the past. They also broke the country apart. For many years, I thought that the system that we inherited could be improved. But that was an illusion. The Stalinist model could not be improved because it was imposed by the Bolsheviks on our country, a system that assumed a monopoly of power, a dictatorship of one party, repression, coercion, the suppression of political and cultural freedom. It is very difficult to go beyond, to move away from that system. In fact, some want to move back to it. Today, there is a resurgence of nostalgia for the strong hand of Joseph Stalin's reign. I'm proud because during the Stalin era, our country became one of the most developed. In what way? We were respected. No, nobody was afraid of us. After the revolution of 1917, the country was revived. It became industrialized. We believed in the future. We had hope. We had belief for a better life. In Georgia, Joseph Stalin's birthplace has again opened up as a museum. In a chaotic world, Stalinism is fondly remembered by some as a time of clarity and strength. It's a legacy that won't easily fade. <laughs> 